Hello, welcome again. For this lesson, we're going to be looking at item writing and moderation. As we mentioned in the previous lesson, once we have our test specifications, we can write the test item, and that is the test questions. We're going to make sure that we cover all of the content and the elements that are specified in a document. Now, the items that we're going to design will be piloted classified and stored in an item bank for further use, which will be obviously the source for various versions of the same test and for subsequent versions of this exam. So the process can be summarized in this diagram. You have your test specifications and your construct. Based on that, you're going to decide what kinds of items are appropriate to measure both the construct and the content that is describing the specifications. Then you're going to design, pilot and analyze the items and once you have made sure that the items are correct, that they measure what they have to measure, that they're valid, valid and reliable, you're going to revise them, classify them according to the level of difficulty for example and put them in a bank for further use. Let's look at the definition of test item. In very simple terms, a test item is just a method for eliciting, that means for inducing, for uh, causing behavior or language, together with a system by which we can assess, we can make judgments about that behavior. In other words, the test taker is going to do something and based on the thing that the test taker is going to do, we can judge if the person has the competence that we are requiring or not, or to what extent. At this point, it is very important to clarify that an item and an exercise are not the same thing. First of all, in an exercise, the students can get help from the teacher or the classmates. But for a test item, the students must answer completely on their own. That is why a test item has to be very clear. second difference is that for exercises that we create we do not require any kind of validity or reliability when we design them but if we design test items we must take every provision to make sure that our items are valid and reliable because remember we're going to judge somebody's performance based on the responses to these items so we have to make sure absolutely sure that the items are valid and reliable there are some important things that we need to take into consideration before we design our test items. First of all, that the test method, or that is the test task, the kinds of questions that we're going to use, may influence the results of the test. It's not the same to ask an open question, for example, than a multiple choice question. Secondly, if we're going to use multiple choice, because this is something that a lot of people use in the test, we must remember that the students may have special strategies to answer the test even if they don't know the answer. We call this test wiseness. In other words, sometimes when we use this kind of test, the results are not going to be very reliable because we may be measuring not competence, but in fact, the student's ability to guess the correct answer. Finally, because of this reason, it is important to use more than one kind of test item to evaluate any competence. And also, we use, should use different kinds of tasks from one test to another. That is, don't use the same kind of items all the time. You have to vary them, use different ones so that you can make sure that what you're measuring is reliable. Now, what are some general guidelines for test design? Number one, and very importantly, make sure that every item measures what it is intended to measure. Remember, we call this validity. Number two, every item must be independent from all other items. That is, if the response on one item depends on the correct response to a previous item, that should not be the case. Every item must work independently. That means that 
If I couldn't answer question two, that should not be an obstacle for me to be able to answer number three. This should be independent. Number three, the instructions for every test item must be clear. We have to write clear instructions so that the students know what they are expected to do. And of course, something very useful a lot of times is to include one example. You will get a question and a sample answer so that the students know exactly what they are expected to do. In the following section, we're going to be looking at different kinds of test items and we're going to be talking about the advantages and the disadvantages of each of them. We'll start with multiple choice items because these are people's all-time favorite. Everybody likes to use multiple choice items in their tests. Something important that we need to consider when we design multiple cho choice items is that there must be just one and only one correct answer. Remember, it is an objective test. So I'm going to show you two examples and we're going to see what could be wrong with them. So number one, which is the odd one out. The options are A, rabbit, B, hare, C, bunny, and D, deer. In this case, you may be tempted to think that deer is the correct answer because all of the other three words refer to the same kind of animal. But in fact, you will realize that we could also say that bunny is the odd one out because the three others are regular words and bunny is a baby word, so it's different from the others. Let's look at the second example. Why hasn't your mother come? Well, she said she, blank, leave the baby. So, because you see that there is reported speech, she said that she, so you will be tempted to say that, oh, the correct answer is couldn't. Well, she said she couldn't leave the baby. But in fact, can't is also possible. Why hasn't she come? She said she can't leave the baby. That means in that moment, she can't leave the baby. So that is also possible. And the same happens with won't which implies a, a will to do something. Well, she said she won't leave the baby. She doesn't want to leave the baby. So that's another possible answer. And of course, mustn't implies obligation. And it's also a possible answer where she said she mustn't leave the baby. So as you can see, this item will be invalid. It will be tricky because normally you expect to have one correct answer and in fact all of these answers could be correct. So if you do want to use multiple choice you need to take these three things into account. Number one, make sure that every distractor is attractive for at least some of the test takers. Don't include absurd distractors things that do not make sense that are obviously wrong because in that case you're invalidating your own items. The second thing is that in general you should include at least four options because remember that with multiple choice the students are going to try to guess. If there are two options they have 50-50% chances of guessing the answer. If, they, if there are four options the chances of the students guessing goes down to 25% and of course if you have 5 it's even better because then their chances for guessing go down to 20%. Finally, whenever it is necessary the items must include a context to avoid ambiguity. This is one example of why it is important to include a content so that our items can be clear and unambiguous. Let's look at the following item. Come back soon. We have to select the option that is closest in meaning to the word underline. So which of these words is closest in meaning to the word soon? When you look at them you realize that soon could mean shortly but it can also mean later, right? It could also be today, right? 
or it could be tomorrow. So the item is ambiguous. We need to create a context so that there is just one correct answer. And so we this is what we can do. We make it in the form of a dialogue. The visitor says, thank you very much for such a wonderful visit. And the hostess says, we were so glad you were here. Come back soon. So now in this case, because there is a context, because there is a conversation, we can see that the only correct answer will be shortly. It could not be later. It could not be today. It cannot be tomorrow. Because the person I went to a restaurant, to a place, and of course when they... When the house says, come back soon, it means, of course, come back in a short period of time. It doesn't mean come back later, or come back today, or come back tomorrow. It means come back shortly. So in this case, by adding a context with the dialogue, we have improved our multiple choice item. Now, there is only one correct answer. Another requirement of multiple choice items is that every option must fit equally well into the stem. The stem is the first part of the question. So no matter what option you read, the sentence should be logical and coherent. Another thing that you need to take into account is that the correct answer must be very similar to the distractors so that it doesn't stand out. For example, your correct option shouldn't be longer or shorter or it shouldn't be written in a different style. Here's one example. Let's look at this item. Somebody who designs houses is a... And the options are A. Designer, B. Builder, C. Architect, and D. Plumber. When we look at the options, it is obvious to us that the correct answer is Architect. Now, imagine that the question is very difficult and you don't know the answer. There are some keys that can help you to find the correct answer. Look at this designer, builder, plumber, and then architect. Now, a person who doesn't know the correct answer to a multiple choice question is going to look for the distractor, for the option that looks different to the others. And that's how they are going to guess the correct answer. So every time you write distractors to multiple choice questions, you have to make sure that they look exactly the same that they are not shorter, that they are not longer, that they don't have something different because then the test takers will guess the correct answer. Another important consideration for multiple choice, especially in comprehension sections, is that you need to make sure that the questions cannot be answered without reference to a text. Example, imagine in this item, the person reads a text about trees and about food. And then you get the question, who gets food from trees? And the options are A, only man, B, only animals, C, men and animals. It is obvious that we don't need to read a text to know that the correct answer is C. So we need to be very careful because this seems obvious, but sometimes people will use like, you know, the biography of Christopher Columbus, for example, to ask questions about who discovered America. Of course, we don't need to read Christopher Columbus biography to know that he discovered America. So, in other words, we should not ask obvious questions. If you have a reading comprehension exercise, the person should be able to answer the question only by reading the text and not because of some general knowledge that they will have before answering the question. Another kinds of items that I want to show you are dichotomous items. Now, these are what we know usually as true or false or yes and no. These kind of items are to be avoided for tests because of the obvious reason that the students have 50% chances of guessing the correct answer even if they don't have the knowledge. Now, I'm just mentioning these kind of items because some tests such as the DELF includes true and false items, but in this case they try to make it more reliable by adding a short answer with it. In other words, you have to answer if the statement is true or false 
but you also have to justify your answer you have to explain why you are saying that it's true and why or why you're saying that it's false so in this case they can verify if, if you really know the answer if you or if you're just guessing of course is the if the justification is wrong you will get a wrong answer another kind of objective items are those that involve ordering words or phrases or sentences or paragraphs these kind of items are generally used to test grammar because grammar involves the order of words which we call syntax and also they are used to assess discourse reference or cohesion or reading comprehension in general we need to say that these kind of items are not very easy to create because words can sometimes have more than one possible ordering for example if I show you these words the and my and ate and a and chicken and in and yesterday and garden and dog you will see that you can arrange them in different ways to create at least three different sentences try it because of this reason we need to take into account that if we use this kind of items the task of marking them is going to be very difficult because there will be several possible correct answers and we need to make sure that we give credit to the test takers for the sentences that they created we also need to say that this kind of task is very artificial because in real life we don't go about reordering letters to create words or rearranging words to create sentences or rearranging sentences to create paragraphs we normally don't do it that way and of course this kind of task assesses other cognitive abilities it, there's some kind of a mental exercise in reordering things you know and sometimes maybe the person is very good at, at English but just cannot find the correct order of the letters to create a word this is like some kind of a mental exercise so normally if we can we should avoid this kind of task another very common kind of objective item is matching now when we use this kind of item we just need to take into account that it's a good idea to provide more options than necessary on one side to increase reliability that means we are not going to ask test takers to join three elements to three elements or five to five we might want to have a different number on one side so that we can make sure that the person is answering the question because he or she is using his or her competence and not because they are just guessing the correct answer if you give me three on one side and three on the other side I'm just going to match them anyway and I will probably guess the correct answer but if you give me three on one side and eight on the other side then it's going to be more difficult for me to guess the correct answer and therefore the item will be more reliable one example from the test of English for international communication the TOEIC and if you see this is a listening comprehension task the person has to listen to five people talking about situations that they have at work and we have five people and the situations that we have on the other side are nine situations so then we know that there are five people talking but we don't know exactly what they're going to be talking about so if you see the fact that I have five options on one side and nine options on the other side makes it difficult for me to guess the correct answer if I had five and five it would be easier for me to guess so this item is more reliable because it has more options on the right side than on the left side and if you create matching items you have to make sure that you do something like this item that we can use in our test is information transfer these are normally used to test reading and listening comprehension and basically what the test takers have to do is to transfer information from a text or a recording into a chart or a table or a map now it is obvious to see that this kind of task is very authentic because we do these kind of things in real life but we also need to consider that these items may be too complex for the students because remember they're going to be like interpreting a graph or reading a map 
and that could be very difficult for some students and in fact it may lead to discrimination because of course reading a map or interpreting a graph may be easier for somebody who studies mathematics but it may be much more difficult for somebody who studies philosophy or literature so we need to make sure that these kind of items do not discriminate some specific kinds of students example of an information transfer item the test taker has to listen to a man who's telephoning to place an order and just fill in with the information that the customer is giving another kind of item involves correcting errors in sentences or short text these kind of items can be used with multiple choice or sometimes the task can be more open now it is important to make sure in any case that there is just one single error in each line of the text and sometimes the test takers can simply be asked to look for the error just find the error without correcting it but this kind of task may be time consuming and sometimes may lead to quite unexpected answers it's an example from the test of English's foreign language the TOEFL and in this case if we read the instruction we will see that they ask us to identify the one underlined word or phrase that must be changed in order for the sentence to be correct let's look at it fewer than half of all of the adults fully understand the kinds and amounts of exercise necessary for an effective physical fitness program so the limitation of this kind of items is that even though we might identify where the error is this doesn't mean that we're competent if I ask you to correct the sentence I am sure that almost all of you will say that the correct answer will be less less than half of the adults however this answer is incorrect because we are talking about count nouns adults so we need to use the quantifier fewer fewer than half of all of the adults that will be the correct answer so the fact that you can choose the element where there is a mistake does not mean that you know what it is correct and this is one of the limitations of this kind of items let's look at another very common type of test item filling in the blanks this is normally used to assess grammar vocabulary or reading comprehension now what is important for these kind of items is to make sure that there is only one correct word for each blank and there is another kind of item that is very similar to this it's called a close the only difference is that we do this on a longer text it's not a sentence with a blank but it's a paragraph with different kinds of blanks and another characteristic is that the blanks may appear every n number of words so for this reason close is relatively more integrative than simple blank filling this will be an example of a close we have a paragraph this is a paragraph from the book and if you see every five words we have a blank one two three four five 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 so we have intervals of words in this case every five words and different kinds of words are deleted so we don't have to fill in the blanks just with nouns or with verbs or with adverbs but they are different kinds of words let's let's answer this and then we'll we'll look at it there are blank filling items these are generally used for grammar vocabulary or reading comprehension it is important to make sure that there is only one correct word for each blank close it is similar to blank filling but it is done on a longer text and blanks appear every n number of words it is relatively 
more integrative than simple gap fill. So as you can see here, what clothes help us to assess is not just grammar, but also discourse, vocabulary, uh, cohesion, coherence, which is part, of course, of discourse competence. Because if you see, there are different kinds of words. For is a preposition, comprehension is a noun, make is a verb, each is a quantifier, to is a proposition, done is a verb in part participle, and is a conjunction, and so on and so forth. So close is a very integrative, very communicative kind of item, and we we'll find this kind of test item in exams such as Cambridge First, Cambridge Advanced, and Cambridge Proficiency, B2, C1, and C2 of the Cambridge examinations. There are some other items that involve transforming sentences. These kind of items are generally used for assessing grammar, vocabulary, and sometimes pragmatic meaning. The test taker is shown a sentence and then given a keyword and a part of the second sentence. So what he or she is required to do is to complete the new sentence, keeping the original meaning and using the new word. Sometimes in these kind of items there is more than one possible correct answer. Example from first B2, a Cambridge exam, and let's look at the instructions. For questions 25 to 30, complete the second sentence so that it has a similar meaning to the first sentence using the word given. This is one example. A very friendly taxi driver drove us into town. And we have the word driven. So we have to use the word driven in the new sentence. And we have part of the new sentence. We, a very friendly taxi driver. So the correct answer will be, we were driven into town by a very friendly taxi driver. So if you see in this case we change the sentence from active to passive. We transform the sentence. These kind of items are very commonly used for all of the Cambridge series from B1 to C2. It goes without saying that transformation tasks may be very difficult for test takers. Here's another example to illustrate this. We have to rewrite the following sentence starting with the words provided. Okay? Here is the original sentence. It was John who saved my life. Now, we have to transform the sentence to fit the new sentence by filling in the blanks with the words that are necessary. So, to keep the original meaning, we have to use a third conditional. If it hadn't been for John, I will have died. These kind of exercises are very difficult and normally in this section of the Cambridge exams, people make a lot of mistakes. We do not get a lot of points in this kind of section. Another very common type of item is short answer. This is one example from Aptis by the British Council. In this case, they give you a little context. I'm going to read it to you. You want to join a travel club. You have five messages from a member of the club. Write short answers one to five words to each message. And we have an example. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. So the person has to read the question, what do you usually do in the morning? And write a short answer, such as, I take a shower. Dictation is another kind of item that is used, but it's not very common these days. Normally, it is used to test spelling and listening comprehension, and it's done with a recording, because we want to provide exactly the same kind of input to all of the test takers. It is called objectively because of course in this case they have to transcribe exactly what they hear so there's just one possible correct answer. As I said before this kind of item is not very common in recent times but it was used in some French examinations. In the following section, we're going to be looking at different kinds of subjective items for tests. 
The first example of such items is text writing. And in this case, there are four important things that we need to take into account. First of all, the instructions must be clear and detailed. Secondly, you must indicate exactly what test takers are expected to produce and how this is going to be assessed. Normally, of course, we're going to be using a scoring rubric, the, which can be adopter, adapter, or design for the purposes. And finally, sometimes the test takers can be given some kind of written or oral input that will serve as the basis for the writing task. That means that they will be given some instructions, some context, or they will have to read some text and then write based on the information that they collected from those documents. An example from Trinity College London, Integrated Skills in English. Let's look at the instructions. Read the text below, then in your own words, present the information given in the text as a blog with two or more contributors, approximately 300 words, debating the validity and practicality of adopting a local board style. So the person has to read the text first and then write it in the form of a blog. If you see they have to use their own words, that means they can read but just use the information, not take it directly from the text, not copy and, and paste. And also they have to change the form. Okay, this is an article and they're going to write it as a blog. And of course there are two or more contributors. So this means that the person has to write using different points of view, different styles, as if two different people were writing in the blog. And of course they tell you how long the text is going to be and the communicative function, the thing that you have to do is to debate the validity and practicality of adopting a local board style. So you can see the instructions are very precise and the person has to write a text. So writing a text is a very integrative and authentic task but we need to be very careful when we write the instructions because we want to elicit different kinds of elements that we're going to assess. For example, we need to tell the test takers the kind of text that they're going to write. Is it going to be a letter? Is it going to be an article? Is it going to be a blog? This will allow us to assess discourse competence as based on the format and the organization of the text. A second element is the goal. If the test takers are going to write a letter, is this going to be a complaint letter or an application letter, for example? The goal of the text is very important because it will allow us to assess the functional competence such as it is reflected in the speech act that the test takers are going to produce. The third element is the topic or the content and in this case we will be able to analyze the vocabulary and the register that the students use. That means that we will be able to analyze lexical and sociolinguistic competence. The fourth element is the interlocutors. We always write a text for a specific public, for a specific audience. In this case, who are they writing to? Are they writing to a close friend? Are they writing to their boss? Are they writing for experts in the field? Specifying the interlocutor of the text is going to allow us to assess sociolinguistic competence. In this case, how they are just the dialect, the register, and the tone of the texts. Another thing will be the style. We will ask them to write, for example, a formal or an informal letter. And this will allow us to assess their sociolinguistic competence. Finally, we also specify the length. Why? Because we don't want them to write too much or too little. Giving a specific number of words for the test takers allows us to make this task more reliable and fair for everybody. Another kind of subjective and integrative test tasks are summaries and they are used to test reading or listening comprehension or sometimes writing. Now this kind of item is very difficult to use because of the cognitive factors that interact with the linguistic skills. Not everybody is able to write a good summary even though they may be very competent linguistically. The rubric that we create for assessing the summary must be clear and of course 
there must be a pilot. Interviews are also very common in examinations. This kind of item measures the general competence. They are integrative and authentic. And of course, the interview must be really clearly structured based on the construct of the ability and the contents of the test. And there must be a very specific rubric for the scoring. And this kind of item generally requires piloting. Another variation of an interview is the role play. And in this case, the candidate is given a card with a description of a context, a situation, and it has to be carried out using the language and adopting a particular role. Role plays measure communicative competence in general, and of course, they are very integrative. They require, however, a very careful piloting, and they are assessed with a scoring rubric. Now, there is another kind of instrument that is used for assessing pragmatic competence. It's called a discourse completion task, or DCT. This type of item is used, as I already said, to measure co pragmatic competence. And we want to elicit speech acts such as invitations, apologies, and requests, but they are in a written form. So first, a situation and some utterances of the interlocutor are introduced. And then the task consists in completing the dialogue with the speech act. In this way, we can analyze both sociopragmatic and pragmalinguistic competence. Example of a discourse completion test. In this case, there are situations and the test taker has to complete with the speech act. I'm going to read you one example. You're having dinner with your friend's family, the food is delicious, and you want to ask for more. What do you say to your friend's mother or father? So in this case, you have to think of an answer such as, Wow, Mrs. Lopez, you're such a great cook. I wish I could have a little more of this soup. So the test taker is going to complete with a speech act and then we can analyze his or her pragmatic competence. I want to end this presentation by showing you the kind of items that are used in two of the most prestigious proficiency tests in the world. The first one is Trinity College London integrated skills in English. For the speaking and listening section, which takes 20 minutes, there are three speaking tasks. One is topic discussion, the second one is a collaborative task, and finally a conversation task. For the listening part, there is one independent listening task. Concerning Reading and Writing, Trinity College London, Integrated Skills in English B2 is going to take two hours and there are two reading tasks. First one includes a long reading and the second one is a multi-text reading task. There is one reading into writing task. This means that the person need first need to read some text or to analyze some information in order to write a text. And finally, there is one extended writing task. So if you see, this exam for the B2 takes 2 hours and 20 minutes. Let us now see the kind of items included in Cambridge's first B2. This is for the reading and use of English section. As you can see, there are many different kinds of items. In part 1, there's a modified clause with multiple choice questions. Part 2, another modified clause, but in this case there are only gaps for you to fill in. In part 3, there is a text containing 8 gaps, and each gap corresponds to a word. They give you the stems of the words, and you have to transform it to find the missing word. In part 4, you get 6 separate questions, each with a leading sentence and a gapped second sentence to be completed in 2 to 5 words. This is obviously a transformation task. In part 4, you get a text followed by multiple choice questions. Part 6 includes a text with jumbled sentences. That means that they are in the wrong order. And of course, you have to find what sentence corresponds to what text. Finally, in part 7, you get 
several short text and 10 multiple matching questions so this is what first b2 includes and if i can mention some differences trinity college london integrated skills in english as the name suggests integrates most of the skills that means that the skills are assessed in an integrated way everything is linked whereas in cambridge at least for the reading and use of english section you get a lot of multiple choice filling in the blanks transforming task and of course both of these exams are very reliable they have a really really strong impact because they provide permanent certifications and any of these that you want to take is highly recommended so this will be all for this part thank you very much and you have to complete a task